Good morning. I hope you're all uh, caffeined up and ready <laughs> for our next session. Um, I think we're talking about uh, transformation through technology and innovation. And uh, I thought about this a little bit. And I think transformation basically is tension. Tension between young and old, um, particularly in people, companies, uh, economies. And uh, the, the word transformation, I come from the startup world, we like to call it disruption. Transformation feels a bit too slow, whereas disruption is more immediate and more aggressive. And then obviously we've got the issue of establishment versus startups. So uh, I think today we're, we're going to cover a couple of topics. Um, we're going to cover transformation in terms of people, or disruption in terms of people, corporations, and governments. And we have these distinguished speakers to, to share that with me. So let's start with people, the, the disruption that we see in human capital. I think um, in terms of tax case, Japan has a very, very rapidly aging population. I think it would be interesting to hear how uh, this is changing the way that, that governments and corporations are dealing with it. OK, thank you very much, uh, Napoleon. Uh, good morning. Um, obviously, Japan is uh, facing uh, a huge aging, I mean, rapidity of the aging society and acute people, I mean, acute labor shortage. So uh, we definitely need a new technology to increase the labor forces, even from the uh, senior citizens. To do so, healthcare industry is very important. That includes um, preventive medicine, um, uh, regenerate, generative medicine by IPS, and just like uh, uh, nutritional products. And uh, there is a growing need of the longer, he healthy longevity in society. People want to live much longer, but healthy. And what is the average life expectancy in Japan? Um, um, depends on the gender, but uh, women uh, 83 or 4. But 10 years, they are under medication. So a lot of medicine. So that means that we define healthy longevity means 10 years younger, 10 years younger. OK. So Not on the medication. Right. So you want to work, you want to live like a normal people. So to do so, there's a very good case. How to prevent the worsening uh, clinical diseases like diabetes. Uh, there is a great case. Um, uh, we used the big data analysis uh, by using the uh, accumulative data from the uh, health insurance claims. The, uh, we developed a certain town developed by a venture how to uh, uh, read those data to find potential patients to be suffered from the serious diabetes. Mm. And those people were focused uh, with the uh, special education, such as diet and a uh, little physical exercise. And uh, uh, as a result, uh, the city, I mean, the town could reduce, achieve to reduce as much as 10% medical costs. In addition to that, potential patients to, to be transferred to the uh, uh, artificial dial dialysis. 50% people were saved. So that means um, they could uh, raise their uh, quality of life. The city could uh, reduce the uh, medical costs, which were, have been uh, swelling a lot. That's a huge problem for Japan. And we, we, what was the period of time that you're talking about? One year. One year. One year. So in one year, you analyzed all the insurance right. claims right. and changed right. the expenses for the That's people. That's right. Two things I would like to address. One. Uh, there was a huge cooperation with the uh, 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 clinics. I mean, that means uh, medical doctors. Usually, they are fiercely against this kind of, you know, uh, activity to invade their business because AI, the, you know, uh, uh, big data analysis, take away jobs, maybe. They feel fear. But eventually, they got uh, trust from people. And then they got more traffic from uh, uh, the potential patients, and plus. Um, so was that data being shared with the doctors? Or was yes, it? yes. Doctors got analysis, and then they just consulted the, the uh, potential patients, and those potential patients listened to doctors' advice. That's the key thing. 
Do we have trust between patients and doctors? Yes, we do. So we leverage the uh, trust in societies. I would say there's still huge trust between the doctors and uh, um, people. So that was a very important. And so uh, could we, could we um, just jump to Jaime, in your, in your country, I think it's maybe an abundance of young people, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how, do you, how do you find that works in, the, in the, the kind of transformation? These young people are obviously the people who are adopting technology. They're the ones whose needs are changing very rapidly. How do you find that affects uh, the demands towards corporations, uh, towards government? We, I, I think you're absolutely uh, correct, Napoleon. We have actually the, the exact opposite of what Tak was talking about. We have uh, basically our average we're now over 100 million people, and um, I would say that the average age is in the low 20s, astoundingly. So we have what, uh, what people have referred to as a demographic dividend, but the changes have been quite extraordinary. Um, uh, first and foremost, on, on, on the whole uh, concept of innovation technology, you've got to have the infrastructure necessary to take advantage of it. And um, our country went through significant shifts and changes in the 90s, our, our government started to liberalize the telecommunication industry, uh, and a massive amount of capital was invested in the sector, including by groups like ourselves. So you, you had massive take up of, of mobile technology and, uh, and, and the start of a broadband network that, that is increasingly robust. Um, the one area, uh, there are many areas you can point to as, as, as shifts that have taken place, and a lot of it do uh, revolve around young people. Uh, but one example I think that's been an incredible phenomenon in our country is this shift in the service sector. Um, the Philippines has, as a country, uh, a, a large uh, diaspora uh, of, of, of uh, uh, Filipino expatriates working across the globe in many different areas. The mirror image of that is what has evolved due to uh, technology and, and corporations beginning to bring costs down and innovate, which is to take their services to countries like ours. Um, the call center phenomenon started uh, in our country. Uh, I remember uh, analyzing our real estate industry in, in, in the early um, uh, 90s, and we were seeing the central bu business district of, of Manila uh, offices being taken up in a slow period by all these corporations putting up these BPOs. We knew nothing about this phenomenon at that early stage, and they were coming to some of the most expensive real estate at the time. Over time, we saw this as a phenomenon and as a group, we started to um, uh, cater to it, build real estate around it, and it's something that began to flourish. Uh, what's fascinating about it is this is an industry, the last time I looked, back in 2011, for example, it generated revenues of about $11 billion. By 2015, it's over 20 billion US dollars. Now, here is a shift taking place globally, um, uh, innovation and technology, uh, allowing corporations now to move out of their home territory and, and shift the services they produce. Now, it started off as a cost-cutting measure, call centers were that, but what's fascinating to me is how that service sector has begun to evolve. Call centers are now a smaller percentage of, of the pie, and for example, just the healthcare business alone being done in these BPOs uh, in the Philippines is, is, is over a billion dollars. And are you, seeing, are you seeing the people who work in those BPOs go out and start their own, a new industry? Is, it, is, this, well, is this kind of there's sporing a, there's a, a new two industry? Stage, there's a two-stage phenomenon which I think is interesting. The first is, and what I wanted to emphasize, is the skill sets are changing. So mm. once upon a time, your skill sets changed when you went abroad, uh, studied mm. something progressive, modern, with new technology. So I remember walking into a, a small office uh, in Cebu, which is a secondary city uh, in the Philippines, and finding a room of 200 young um, graduates from a local university in Cebu doing CAD CAM analysis for a petrochemical facility in Saudi Arabia for a Japanese company. Now, mm. never in a million years would a team of students from that school would be doing that kind of sophisticated work under any other circumstances. And the list goes on. Uh, legal work being done for Microsoft, equity analysis for Morgan Stanley. I mean, you name it. Now, that is a change and shift on the skill set taking place because that industry came through the Philippines. Because of innovation, because of technology, there was a shift. And so uh, those skill sets now evolve. Um, there is turnover in the industry and they move on, as you're hinting, uh, Napoleon, to, to a movement either into those sectors by these young people or 
there is a new startup culture also beginning to take place. And I think what, what's fascinating in your country's case is that you should be exporting the physical people. Mm. What you're talking about now is that the, the skill sets are still there, but you're exporting the talent. Well, the people the, are staying in the, in the country, but the people, the corporations are coming to them. Well, I think the two things are happening in conjunction, and, yeah. and one must understand that. I, I think the service sector globally has changed, and it's a product of technology. Um, and um, you know, it's the, the, the issue of people also moving out is, is, is a changing phenomenon. We've been very much a part of that movement in, in many sectors um, uh, of, of, of the service, in healthcare, in, in, in IT. Uh, I was just with the New Zealand ambassador uh, a year and a half ago, and he said 20,000 Filipinos are setting up the telecom infrastructure in New mm -hmm. Zealand, building it and, and putting out. So I believe the service sector has changed, but the technology component of it is what's created this mirror image of bringing, uh, keeping people at home and bringing corporations across borders to do work that tr they traditionally uh, would do in their own countries. Now, that brings up political issues. Uh, in the US, it's much discussed, should we be allowing our work to move outside our boundaries? So uh, the technology is there, the disruption is there, uh, the movement is there, it's benefiting emerging markets, and that's just one little window into it. Uh, on the other hand, it's creating political pressures and, and, and a discussion of whether workforces should be allowed to shift like this. So I, I leave it, uh, I guess, at that. So for you, Richard, you brought up something very interesting when we were talking about people. And it's kind of connected to what Jaime was saying in terms of, uh, you know, uh, porous borders, right? People trusting each other. So I, I think, um, how do you see, I mean, you've written a book about various elements of this, but. Um, how do you see the trust element? Because once you start doing business across borders and you're you know, tapping into talent in other countries, isn't trust a very essential element in that? Well, I, I mean, technology as a disruptor is changing the way that trust works. Um, just as a reminder, the pace at which we are getting technology, dis uh, technology has been disrupting things for hundreds of years. Think about the printing press destroying all the monks' jobs. It's just happening at a different speed and scale. I mean, just a couple of numbers to share that and then come back to what this means for trust. The first printing press to the first computer printer was about 500 years. The first computer printer to the first 3D printer was 30 years. The horse and cart to the car was about 5,000 years. The car to the first self-driving car, 130 years. So 5,000 years versus 130. So we're getting this acceleration of technology and acceleration of adoption. So the telephone took 75 years before 50 million people were connected to it. Radio took 38 years. Um, TV, 13 years. Facebook, about a year. And Angry Birds 4 got to 50 million people in 35 days. <laughs> so think about Angry Birds 4, 35 days, the telephone 75 years mm. comparison. I, when I talk to my children about it, they say it's not surprising. I mean, who after all uses the telephone? I mean, Angry Birds 4 is obviously a much more useful thing but to if use. If you talk to children nowadays, they'll, they'll be saying, who plays Angry Birds 4? That's well, so they, they, may, they may say <laughs> so that, yes. I, I have slightly older so children, passe, yes. right? so, so, so we've got this technology coming in faster and faster. Now, technology has resulted in big shifts in the way we trust people. The corporation, you look at all the measures, governments, the media is a lot less trusted in, in the world. So you talk to the millennials, they go to see their doctor, they won't do what their doctor says until they've gone out and looked at research papers on it and actually looked at the underlying research before they, they make a decision on it. So we've got a deterioration of trust as a result of that. And our political systems, we'll come back and talk about the politics a bit later, has deteriorated. So, so we've got this deterioration of trust, but at the same time, people are prepared to leave the key to their house under the doormat and have a total stranger live in their house for the weekend. Th think about it. <laughs> I mean, it's extraordinary. We're trusting people less and less, but we leave the key under the doormat because we trust this person because they are rated on Airbnb. Think, think about it. Technology is creating a new form of trust in a very different way, where technology is destroying trust in most of the other ways. Mm. Now, what does that mean? I think the Airbnb rating system or Amazon ratings, we've only seen the start of this. One of my colleagues has a very wacky idea that 
when you get on a plane, your app that has the boarding pass will show you all of the flight attendants on that plane, and you'll be able to personally rate them, <laughs> how good they were. Uh, in the same and, way and, the and attendants they will can rate, rate you. you back. They yeah. will rate you, and you will get your score. You know, you're a difficult passenger, bad luck, you're by the loo so let, let, in economy. Let, let's you're a good this. passenger, you get upgraded <laughs> because you've got good ratings. Think about that, how that would change our flight experience. One of the experience, one of the people that, that people enjoy traveling in Uber is that because you're rating each other, you actually behave yourself better. You have a different experience because the drivers rate the passenger and the passenger rates the driver. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, actually, right. this is no longer what Mike would call as one period game. This is a multi-period game because you've created the multi-period game through technology. And I think that we're seeing, you know, lots of other technology disruptions are happening, but I think the way that technology changes the nature of trust, the nature of games becoming multi-period games, we've only seen the start of it. And actually in a world where trust has deteriorated, in a world where we've got ISIS and Donald Trump and all of that, we may, <laughs> we may find that the creation we'll come back to that later. of, I mean, no, you put them in the same sentence. Um, uh, we may see that the way that technology can rebuild this trust, this trust relationship between people through the likes of the Airbnb rating system actually could create a, a new form of trust, a trust that goes across borders and a trust that, that, that could work in this different world. Can I bring that, that trust back to your case? In, in the city's called Kure, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, did you find that that came up, the trust element? Because obviously, if uh, you're sharing your data into some ether, uh, well, were, were these old people that, or these people with the diabe diabetic, were they aware that they was, they, you know, their information was being shared into some large pool? I mean, how, how did you build the trust in that relationship there between, was it Suntory who was behind it? Yeah. Well, so Suntory, the corporate, the doctors, uh, and the patients, how, how did you build that trust? I mean, technology fact, is one. Suntory has uh, no relation with this case, but as are the, uh, uh, the advisor to the uh, government, um, okay. so much related. Um, at first, uh, there was a crisis feeling uh, shared among the older people because of the swelling caused from uh, you know, medical treatments yeah. and uh, medication. So everybody uh, shared the fact we can't sustain the current uh, expenditure to social uh, activity, I mean social uh, things like uh, uh, medical treatment. And then, and plus, uh, uh, people don't know so much about uh, what will happen, but the people understood because of the uh, educational programs led by the city. What about uh, after all of the uh, two, three years of the uh, artificial uh, 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 dialysis? It's dead. And people don't know seriously so much. So education uh, was done through the, uh, the, the corporate, I mean, public services. Then they, they just uh, found it's, it's a really serious thing. And uh, you want to live with the uh, healthy condition. And then the doctors are so trusted in society in Japan still uh, because of the uh, universal health insurance system that supports the doctor's dignity, as a matter of fact. And then the people uh, try to understand uh, the, uh, the uh, data knowledge at first um, to share with the doctors because you can talk to doctor with the about uh, you know uh, things that you don't want to uh, open to other people. Another thing is uh, the city tries to 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 to, to keep the confidence. I mean confidential. The uh, each everybody's uh, detailed data. Mm. Only doctor and my son. That was a strict policy at that time. So some of the trust was the one right. to one. Exactly. Then there was the group trust. Right. And and another factor is uh, at that time Kure. Uh, uh, brought uh, the uh, uh, venture to develop uh, the uh, application to analyze data because uh, aggregate of the data itself is, uh, you know, you have good data, you have bad data, lots of data you have to deal with. And among the, those data, you have to pick up uh, good data you can analyze. So, so were, the, were the data scientists? When you yes, said yes, data scientist was uh, uh, brought by the city okay. and uh, uh, they, they, they developed the application, which is good for uh, data analysis and uh, uh, very efficient and effective data analysis to be given to the doctor. The doctor talks to the, uh, each patient. And the, so how has that continued? This was this year, That's last year? That's the question, last year. Yeah, last year. That so how is, is the, 
How well, have you built on that? Trades are fine, but uh, what about the central government to yes. apply to other cities to mm. reduce entire social you know, costs? As a matter of fact, there is a huge resistance from the doctors' association, medical doctors' association, because they feel still we will lose a lot of jobs because of this kind of technologies. So the trust doesn't exist in the in, in, you know, uh, vested interest groups. But like I can nurses. understand that because in Japan, when you, from outside Japan, when you watch the media, Japan is moving robots very rapidly into the households. Right? Yes. Uh, that's so the, if uh, a doctor could, if a robot could replace a doctor, well, there surely are two there's kinds. a lot of nervousness and anxiety about that. Right, two kinds. One is uh, a medical treatment, which is uh, the uh, doctor's uh, area. The yeah. second is a new segment, which is nursing home to take care of uh, older people. Mm. That part is pretty new. So there's uh, no vested interest player. So easy to accept the new technology. Whereas uh, Medical Doctors Association is so rigid, always asking for subsidies from the government. We don't want to accept the new technology. We are the, uh, just like a gods. We can you know, give a diagnosis. You guys have to believe me. That's the, all, you know, still. But the Korea City convinced the uh, Doctors That's Association. That's a case study for the, right. interesting. So going back to the, the trust thing, Jaime, I wanted to ask you because, um, you know, having worked in large corporations and then having my own business, there's a, there's the social media has created this lack of trust yeah. mm -hmm. in large corporations, so I'd say. But so how do you deal with that being, you know, the chairman of a large corporation? How do you, how do you see a, a large corporation, which some move fast, some don't? How do you deal with that, that trust element which Richard brought up? Well, I think the, the two elements, I think the world increasingly has become far more transparent for all of us, and that has implications to both large institutions and individuals. I think the, the small fallacy, uh, it is a new reality. I think you have to embrace it. Uh, there were massive debates many years ago, you know, do you allow Facebook on, uh, you know, in, into the yeah. office, do you not? And I've always argued, you, you've got to embrace all this. You've got to be part of it. You've got to get feedback from it. There is the other side of it, and I think Tak was beginning to hint at it with the word bad data, which is, you know, not everything out there is great stuff. Uh, yeah. Not everyone's opinion is, is a great opinion. Uh, we've, uh, I think, all become far more sensitive about what's happening uh, in, 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 uh, through the social media networks, and I think it is wise for us to do so. But that doesn't mean to say that uh, what's coming out of there is always intelligent or, or, or correct, or, but the fact that we have to embrace it, I think there was a period of time, but that was a long time ago, when, when corporations were trying to decide, do you participate in all of this or not? Uh, and, and I think all of us have evolved to basically say it, it, it needs to be embraced. Um, but that issue of trust is, is a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, not everything out there is, um, is true. And I think there are new notions of trust evolving, uh, and people will have to differentiate themselves in this new media. At the beginning, there was a fervor. Everything that came out was embraced. Uh, now I think people are beginning to categorize what they can trust and what they can't. And that's where I think there is room for some of the old guard in mm -hmm. traditional areas yeah. whose names were respected yeah. Yeah. evolving into this space. I think after things settle down, yeah. people will go right. back to those institutions, news agencies, information sources that have built trust in their own way. And perhaps yeah. it was in the old economy. And I think they will succeed, I believe, in, in this new economy. I, I think you're right about the trust in, in the individuals because they become more transparent. But I think what's happening now is there's a need for new business models, right? You're seeing people are saying, I don't like the way that you sell this to me. You know, I don't want to buy it this way. The way that I want to do it is I want little tactions or I want you know, to pay bite by bite. So I, I think what's interesting, uh, I think we can move on to this a little bit, is more the, um, in the kind of transformation, what do you see with business models? You're dealing with this a lot with McKinsey, but you know, there's, there's a new, there's a new, this accelerated yeah. change. How, is, how do you see the business models so, changing? So, so, and let's be clear, the last 30 years, all of our business experience has been a wonderful bit. Global corporate profits have expanded on a net income basis from about 7% of global GDP to about 10%. So that's growing at something like 6.5%. It's been eight in real terms. It's been a great period. Corporates have benefited from global supply chains, expansion of the consuming classes. We've gone from a billion to two billion to four billion consuming class people. 
benefited from falling interest rates. Interest rates in the 1980s were 14% or so nominal, they're now two, uh, and have benefited in most cases from falling taxes. Now, we think a lot of those um, massive tailwinds for the corporate sector is coming to an end, and part of the challenge is going to be the changing nature of competition. There's going to be tougher economics. Interest rates clearly can't go any further south, and government's increasingly starting to say, you know, the tax deals that you've got, corporations, no longer acceptable. So, so we're going to see that reversal. But the biggest change is going to be the changing nature of competition. And I can give three examples about how, how that changes. The, the, the first... Um, Example is just the, the pace and the innovation that we're going to see. And this is where I really think Asia is going to be one of the most exciting parts of the world to drive this. Um, as an example, the last time the, um, uh, a number of you, you know that India as a country has a space program. They were the first Asian country to manage to space program, to, to put an orbit around Mars. And they were the fourth space program in the world to do it. But that's not the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing is they put this orbit around Mars for $75 million. Now, to put $75 million in context, the film Gravity cost $85 million to make. <laughs> and the last time the Americans bought an orbiter from Lockheed Martin, it cost $700 million. <laughs> $700 million. This is not a 10% reduction. This is a 90% reduction in terms of the cost. And they, the way they did it was very different. I was speaking to a whole bunch of US space executives, and I gave this example. And they came up to me after and said, that's a very unfair example. They couldn't do the tracking. We had to have NASA had to do the tracking for this. They couldn't get the guidance system to work. They bought it from us. It wasn't really a proper space program. They didn't do it all themselves. And of course, you know, that's a bit like saying Uber's an unfair example. Uber 20 years ago would have had to put cell towers in and build lots of devices, and they just piggybacked over these cell yeah. towers and all of that in the innovation. So I think the first big shock in competition is going to be these disruptive models that, that come in. But what's interesting about you, yeah. what you just said is the disruptive models are not coming from the original, well, the, you know, the incumbents. It's not just I North mean, America and Europe. Your, your case was India. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've seen disrupting coming from I, I, China. Iran, you were saying Iran, soon? Sure. <laughs> so uh, yeah. maybe even Cuba. Brazil, Brazil. I mean, you know, you look at, look at the, the 10 years ago, everyone said the best one run beer company in the world was Anheuser-Busch. Look at how the Brazilians are now running that business. They're mm. getting better returns from that business. So, so this is about different players coming in, often emerging markets. So it's not necessarily just, just Asia, you, you know, the guys yeah. at Greekcom or whatever. You know, I mean, they are running mm. that business better. I mean, that's the first disruption. There are a couple of other things happening. The second one is the rise of emerging market companies in general who are going to bring this innovation in. And the third sort of big disruption, and, and you know, we, we think that half of the world's largest companies by 2030 are going to come from emerging markets. And if you're shocked well, by what that do you, number, What do you define as emerging market? Because well, okay. it seems to be changing rather rapidly. Well, I'm I mean, not current, current emerging markets. So, I mean, you know, they may not be emerging markets at that point. So, so in Japan's yeah. case, Japan's aggressively uh, going overseas, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but it's, it's no market. longer an emerging market, no, right? No, not, not, in, not in our numbers. So, so I'm, I'm right, curious, yeah. in, in the, you're talking yeah. about the globalization of, of kind of transformation pushing that, right? Yeah. So how do you see this from your perspective where you know, Japan's always been seen as a very, in the technology world, you know, very creative. Uh, originally making things smaller, now making things sort of, you know, better quality. How do you see that changing now in the kind of globalization or Japanese companies going overseas? I know. Well, obviously, we've been uh, in the uh, uh, decline of population and the market has been shrinking. So definitely go overseas, like uh, even the states and the developed economies as well as the emerging economies. Then uh, what shall we do in the domestic uh, business? That's R&D. Uh, use uh, you know, lots of technological breakthrough. Uh, for example, Suntory is now working on the uh, R&D to create a, you know, natural, no, nutritional product like uh, a lactic acid uh, bacteria because we found the, uh, the relationship between the brain function and uh, uh, intestine. For example, we have a strong dream, big dream that uh, someday somehow we will find the uh, nutri nutritional product to work uh, uh, for the, uh, the uh, reducing the possibility to become, uh, to, to suffer from uh, uh, Alzheimer, for example. We're working on it. And the pr production should happen in the Philippines, for example, mm. in Indonesia. 
So we want to be a hub of mm. R&D because so, so of the, the TPP, for example. You're saying the research would be in Japan, but the production, production would be in Indonesia. Yeah, that's right. And the market would be? States and the state, I mean, uh, Japan, those who are going to be suffered from uh, aging society, even in Asia, rapidity of the aging is mm -hmm. so, sure. so rapid, I mean, uh, so, so much. Uh, think about the 2030 in China. More people are suffered from uh, aging society, which means kind of slow, but the people want to work, people yeah. want to live like, uh, you know, normal people. So technology is the center, I mean, core of the, uh, of our intention, I mean, attention to the uh, Japanese economy. And do you see this, Jaime, do you see this um, with the Philippines? Do you see a, a lot of uh, the kind of global, the sped up, uh, where you see some of the Filipino companies expanding overseas because they feel the market in the Philippines is limited? Or, or are you starting to see that happen maybe more in the transformation of technology space? Or is it more around the services that you yeah. talked about? I, I think it's more around the services. I, d yeah. I think we're still a little bit insular as a country. Yeah. But maybe to make um, uh, a, a broader point following the lines that you're hinting at, Napoleon, I think there's going to be a bit of a shift between what the private sector starts to do and the empowerment that they get based on what Richard's saying and the tools that they now have. Uh, if, the, if, if, if the framework of information technology, of broadband, of, of telecommunications is enabling new things, there's going to be a shift taking place, and, and I think it, 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 it harks back to something Professor Spence was mentioning, both in his opening uh, remarks and in an article he wrote, which is the capacity for people to adjust to this is going to be the key. Now, I like to think in all our societies, uh, Hong Kong included, that the private sector tends to be quite malleable and, and adjusts quickly. It's the nature of the capitalist system. And uh, people are quick to get opportunities yeah. along the lines Richard was mentioning, and they adjust to it. I think what's a little bit slower generally is the public sector. Mm. The public sector uh, mm. uh, don't have the incentives that, that the private sector do. They tend to be a little bit more rigid, a little bit more formal, and the whole regulatory structure uh, around this is slower. So mm. I guess the point I'm making is uh, whether one goes global or not, um, there is going to be, I think, a tension for a period of time between private sector initiatives and a public sector that is trying to catch up both on the regulatory side and the like. I mean, one simple example, for example, Uber came to the Philippines, expanded, and uh, the taxi association said, you know, stop. Mm. Government, you know, needed the political votes, put a hold on it, and you've got this tension. That's just a proxy for many yeah. other areas. So um, I think you're gonna get this, uh, this adjustment taking place, and I think what's important for everyone to understand is uh, the young people growing, the kind of people we hire, the educational system of countries, they're gonna have to adjust very quickly to give people the mental tools and the breadth to be able to take advantage of these changes that are taking place. Those that don't, I think, will, will have trouble. But you, 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 I mean, you make a very good point about the private sector versus the public sector. Do you think it's the role of the corporates who are more nimble than the public sector to invest in the education of those young people? To, to, to kind of spur the industry? Because I mean, for example, in Hong Kong, we've just had CY Leung announce mm. a two billion Hong Kong dollar budget uh, to boost you know, the innovative uh, kind of technology space here. But I, I sat in a room of 20 VCs who are all licking their chops, thinking, ooh, two billion dollars, what can we do with that? But actually, if you thought about it, that money might be spent much more intelligently through through you know, the grassroots community than giving it into, into these VCs. You know, N Napoleon, you hit on something that I find absolutely fascinating. I, I think the whole educational space is, go is going through massive disruption. We, uh, in the Philippines, we saw a problem taking place. Our, our, the private sector was growing, our economy is doing very well, uh, and there was a need to bring people in. Um, but the public sector educational system was struggling. Uh, we have a relatively high growth rate as a country, and the facilities were not catching up. I personally took the bull by the horns and, and, and argued uh, somewhat successfully uh, with the Department of Education to allow private sector capital to start entering and, and helping address this need. There was, again, it goes back to this private public. We felt the need, we wanted to address it, we saw a business opportunity. Um, the public sector had a standard way of doing things mm. and were more nervous uh, about allowing this. Mm. Um, 
I think there's a great opportunity for private sector engagement in, in, in the educational space. And I'll just give one little anecdote um, as to how innovation and changes come. I if mm. you keep your peripheral vision open, there's so many shifts and externalities that come with it. So we had an investment, for example, in, in this BPO industry we were talking about, business processing industry, and it was expanding. And I asked our team who were responsible for it, what have you learned about other industries that might be of interest to our group uh, outside the field of business processing? And they highlighted, and after a lot of discussion, they said, well, there's a little sliver of the business that's quite interesting, which is when people come out of high school and enter these business processing um, uh, centers, they're actually not ready to enter. And I said, tell me more about it. And they said, well, actually, we have to train them for six months before they're ready to enter. And I said, well, well, let's take that idea. What can we do yeah. with it? And they said, and I'm not going to give you a long story. We basically took that germ of an idea and entered the educational space and basically are aiming to build high schools that will transform the last two years into a much more engaged process to get people ready for employment. We feel it's a great business idea and at the same time help the development goals of the country. And so we're, we're hijacking with the Department of Education support the last year of their high school because, uh, you know, a lot, the vast majority of Filipinos don't enter college. And so you've got to get them ready for the workforce there. But just anecdotally and through our pilots, if you get them geared for the workforce in that last year, rather than following the traditional curriculum, and we took average students, not brilliant students, the engagement and the ability of the workforce to high, hire them moved up astronomically. So that was an idea that yeah, came yeah. from innovation. Uh, yeah. it, it just kept the peripheral vision mm -hmm. on, on a completely different industry and open up uh, ideas on, on another one. And it was the, the, those, those, those students liked it because they felt they'd been taught something practical with a, with a clear career path rather than studying history? Well, actually, the, when we did the pilots in a couple of small universities, mid-level universities, um, everybody put their hand up. We said, look, we've got a pilot program going, you know, who wants to enter this track? Yeah. Everybody said yes. Uh, they were excited. And then what was amazing is that the results, uh, and, and I was quite insistent, I want average students. I don't want, you know, special students. But just the sheer adjustment of preparing an educational structure for the employment side, rather than just following a traditional curriculum, just getting them geared up. And a lot of it involves, as you well know, a lot of interactive communication, a lot of working with computers, a lot of simulations, a lot of selling, uh, a lot of understanding what uh, different industries need right off the bat. But the actual content itself was also uh, innovative in nature. Well, that's not exactly just, it. Uh, the, not content just the, was the, a, the, the content really came from industry. And okay. we got that content from industry and inputted it, I guess, into the program. Pat, you, you, you seem like you've, yeah. you've been involved in something like this in, in Japan. Right. Uh, regarding education, um, for the private sectors, um, we can't wait to educate people from uh, this level of the uh, numbers. And definitely, uh, we are now working on uh, uh, bringing from outside, mm -hmm. Indians and uh, mm -hmm. uh, people who got uh, some business background uh, in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, we built uh, the, uh, I mean, Suntory built uh, the uh, World Innovation Center in Kyoto, and uh, we are now recruiting from uh, outside. It's, 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 it's uh, difficult for, for us to ask the government to, to change entirely the educational system. So definitely we have to bring in uh, high-skilled uh, uh, laborers and, uh, from uh, outside because speed, agility mm -hmm. is very important because uh, this is the game of the always, uh, I mean, I mean, first mover's advantage. Definitely we have to work on the new technology mm -hmm. as soon as possible. We need people. We don't have to, you know, hire Japanese people. We should hire people from any, anybody from the world. That's what we have to do. In that sense, we have a challenge, which is IP. Well, I said, mm. we just want to work on R&D much more as a big activity in Japan, bringing in people from outside. But how to deal with IP to produce things in other countries? So we just uh, um, have been working on uh, TPP agreements a lot because of IP. IP is uh, very important to produce things in other countries. So I want more countries to participate in IP. Though I'm so concerned about the situation in the US um, because of the political situation sure. is so unstable. 
But uh, IP is a very important one. And plus, the, this kind of research and the development needs a long-term commitment of management. Whereas uh, the, uh, even Japan, I think uh, things have been uh, moving toward the short-termism. Technology needs a consistent policies, consistent management. So that means just like a healthcare, we don't know what will happen, but we have a strong dream. We want to make it happen, but that takes a lot of time. Though technology definitely will shorten the time frame, but it still takes time. And uh, I'm so worried about the short-termism of the world. I think uh, what you have is the passion, which yeah. is obviously the... <laughs> I think the, the, the IP is an interesting, interesting topic um, and, and confusing to talk about, right? Because obviously when you're collaborating across multiple economies, who owns the core IP is right. a, a separate issue. Uh, Richard, in your, in your book, No Ordinary Disruption, you talk about this idea that everybody's intuition needs resetting, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. can you explain how that works in, in the kind of the, the context of what we've just been speaking about? Because, you know, as you get older, you think you have better intuition, right? Experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what that, what, what you, how you see that playing out. Well, so the premise is that um, because we're seeing technology and emerging markets and globalization aging, disrupting the world economy, much of our experience will get us the wrong answer if we don't rely on it. And so just taking the example about you know, what we might have thought that was a good subject for our children to study at university. 20 years ago, we might have said, look, go off and study you know, media studies or PPE because you'd get a, a, a nice job or law or whatever. Increasingly, that may be the wrong subject to study. You know, the, the jobs that are increasingly being created and are paying more jobs that require science, technology, engineering, and maths. And when we said maths a few years ago, you know, it was number theory and algebra, I mean, calculus. Actually, that's not the type of maths we need. We need big data analysis and statistics, some of the perhaps less sexy part of maths, to be honest, <coughs> if, we, if we think about that. So we all need to go through that process of resetting our intuition on what's the right thing we should be educating. And also how we educate. So I think for Jaime's examples mm. about this course and how you were running it using computers uh, is a very different way. If you go to most universities go around the world, they really are operating on roughly the same student to ratio and the roughly the same curriculum as Plato used to run it. We really, in 2,000 years, have not really changed the but way the, but we deliver isn't, education. But isn't a whole new, this whole concept of MOOC? Absolutely. And that, I always forget what the model. acronym stands yeah, for, yeah, massively yeah. online yeah. Cool, 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 yeah. curriculum, okay, yeah, right? Yeah. But that so is a different way of delivering. The your computer one, you know, it's a different way of delivering. And something you go away from the Couldn't somebody to sit in, in Cebu yeah. and do a Stanford course? Absolutely. You can do it now, right? Yeah, you can do it yeah. Yeah. That's online. Right. Um, so that the, the educated, the access to this yeah. information, I yeah. think, is, is one part. But the actual, what I'm, what I'm concerned about is who drives that? Is, well, it, driven, it, is it driven by corporate? I, I is think it, it driven by government? Yeah, I think, first of all, corporates have to play a much bigger role. So I was talking to the former prime minister of New Zealand. He said one of the things he was most proud of having done was he increased the proportion of graduates in New Zealand by 30% when he was prime minister, or whatever, 20%. He said his biggest mistake was he let the current academics decide the subjects people were going to go and study. And if you think about it, you know, part of what you've got to do is you've got to start saying, well, what do people really need yeah. and build those exactly, courses? Yeah. And that mm. information flow, and that information flow has been, in most cases, pretty disastrous in terms of that. He, his comment was, you know, we don't need more people with media studies degrees. We need more people with science and engineering. And I think that, that how we get that link to work is, I think, one of the challenges, how we get employers to say. And then there's the second thing, which is, you know, there's a limit to how much you can learn at university. You actually, or college or school or whatever, you have to find a way of getting the right incentive for on-the-job training. And there is a risk that the companies that make a big effort on on-the-job training find that they just get their people poached at the end of it, and they made that big investment. And I think that's where the role of government comes in. And you know, is there a way that governments can subsidize the apprenticeship program so that if people get pulled out from these companies to other companies that are, are not investing, you get a payment. So I think it is about private sector, but it also is a role for government as mm. well. And do you, I mean, the big data you've talked about a lot, I mean, in the, in the education stuff that you're saying, Jaime, I mean, you, you, through your organization, you must have access to gazillions of data from mm. transactions mm. to 
where people like to eat, to, I mean, to everything. I, I, right? I wish so I could say we've been brilliant at harnessing <laughs> it. We have not. Uh, you're right, it is an opportunity, and I think the harnessing of data is great. It's um, harder to do than, than meets yeah. the eye. Conceptually, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, but I think we will all move in that direction. But I'd just like to say with Richard's point, if you'll allow me, Napoleon, because I think uh, uh, I love the point Richard's made about, about intuition changing. You know, mm. we, we all, conventional wisdom, the way our brains work and, and the patterns that, that we make decisions with, it, it is so geared to, to past experience in many ways. Yeah. Of course, we learn, we retool, yeah. but, but I think you make a, a superb point, and uh, I find it very, very interesting. But moving beyond that, I think what we've tried to do in a very small way in the Philippines, uh, in, a, in a small grouping of businessmen, is um, we put up a, a foundation where we have harnessed, and it's the first time it's happened in our country, I'm sure it happens elsewhere, where we meet uh, formally once a year between the leaders of academe and the leaders of industry mm. and have a very serious structured dialogue over three days as to what is needed by yeah. this industry. And, and Tak was hinting about just taking the bull by the horns and just doing it himself. Mm. There's a limit to what can be done, and yeah. I think some people have no choice but to do that. But if that dialogue doesn't take place I in a sincere way and in a way where both sides are listening and adjusting, those countries, I think, will fall behind. Um, and the only way, uh, and, 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 and that whole issue that, that Richard was talking about, intuition and the way our brains work, if, if that doesn't get tooled uh, and retooled in, in, in a way, my, my own daughter, you, you hit a home run with that, was saying to me in her freshman class at university, she said, I'm, I'm gonna take computer programming. And I said, you know, I, I grew up with the humanities and all of this, and I was sort of saying, well, you know, shouldn't you? She said, look, it's the language of our generation. <laughs> Nobody is worth anything if they don't at least know the basics of mm. of, uh, of 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 computer language. And and I said you're right, you know. And 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 they're also beginning to adjust to new realities. So I think this whole influx. Uh, the main point I want to make is between industry and 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 academe, and having a serious dialogue uh, between what one is producing and the other one demands. I think has to be far more rigorous now than it ever has been. And if it's not taking place, then I think there will be a gap in this sector of the needs that this new economy uh, necessitates. Some, of course, will be brilliant, and young people, by their very nature, educate themselves. So you will get people adjusting on mm -hmm. their own. But it is, I think, correct that also there be an adjustment, I guess, in the teaching faculties and in the educational institutions to adjust to these new needs and not be based on, I guess, a standard way of thinking. Yeah. And th this is a perfect place to talk about that. So let's bridge between our stage here, break down the academic barrier, <laughs> and take some questions from the floor. I think we have about 10, 15 minutes to do that. So uh, please uh, do put your hand up if you have a question. Do I see any? There's so many bright lights, it's very hard to see what's happening. I see somebody running with a microphone. running for a coffee or a question? <laughs> 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 Got to get a cookie. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thanks for the panelists for the great discussion. Uh, I'm Hai Peng Chen. I'm from uh, the business school here at HKU. Uh, so uh, as, as I listen through the discussion, I, what, one of the things I was very happy to hear about is the discussion about big data and healthcare. And uh, part of the reason is we're all humans. We care about and we need for better quality of healthcare, right? Another reason is I was trained as a data scientist and I do big data analytics in healthcare. So as we discuss, one of the things is the trust and availability of data and whether people are open to share the data. So I was wondering whether the panelists can offer some uh, discussion or insights on um, how do, can we make people, make entities open to the idea of sharing data. Uh, you know, one of the things in, in this forum uh, we are very familiar with bank, banking system. So people put money in bank, and we trust bank. Uh, there's a confidentiality that are guaranteed, and as a return, we also get something from depositing the money in the bank. So w whether we can use the same, this analogy to a bank for data, where owners of, ba of data put their data into a common bank, and the bank manages the data, but they don't own it. And as a way, uh, we get some re something in return. So I wonder whether you can offer some discussion on that. Thank you. Excellent question. I think um, th this, this topic of data and, uh, is, and personal data, particularly medical data, 
is probably the hardest challenge. Right? I mean, America's, North America's trying to deal with that. Microsoft's trying to deal with it. How do you see that? I mean, you've started it with the little city. How, you've obviously got a, a, a passion about this. Yeah. How do you see that being a, a shared, a communal data bank? It's a great question. Um, there's no hacking yet, uh, uh, this kind of industry, because it doesn't you know, create a new business by hacking. Uh, whereas in finance, definitely creates a, something new to, to generate the cash inflow to your pocket. Uh, but having said that, um, we are very careful about uh, 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 dealing with data, but uh, there's no uh, uh, strong technology to, 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 to make it uh, very confidential from any kind of uh, uh, aggressive uh, attack to the data. Just uh, this uh, 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 healthcare uh, challenge to, to lower the uh, medical cost using big data is uh, between the, uh, um, among the trusts of the uh, city, uh, the municipal government, and the people, doctors. So that means uh, uh, we make use of the current uh, trust community, trusted community. And uh, we haven't uh, touched upon uh, data security, for example, because uh, uh, this is uh, driven by trust. But uh, we may have to think about how to protect the data analysis. But having said that, we are trying to mask uh, you know, individual names to analyze because we want to have the kind of probability of the, the, the uh, symptoms of certain disease at first. And that applies to the each patient plus individual uh, analysis. So uh, the part of the individual analysis, we have to work on the uh, protection of the data and the data security has to be studied much more. But uh, this is applied to any other data security, right? But in the, uh, the healthcare space, um, it's not advanced yet because uh, we don't deal with the, uh, the uh, data mm -hmm. hacking of the, uh, the data like uh, healthcare. It, that's a, that is not a big issue at this moment. So, so Richard, um, I actually think there is a company or two that are doing exactly what he's talking about. There's one run by a famous American gentleman called Mark Zuckerberg. Surely they have all the data they need to tell you whether you're going to die tomorrow of diabetes or whether you, you know, you're worthy of marrying this person because of the, what they eat. Or, I mean, uh, so I, I think... Um, Going back to Jaime's point about the, you know, the kind of nimbleness of the corporate. In the world we live in now, there's, there's these companies out there that have sucked us all in. They have data falling out of the trees. I mean, they, they can, uh, the, currently it's being used for advertising purposes, right? So my, my question is like, how do you take that data and use it for educational purposes? I mean, Facebook, mm -hmm. surely you could create bridges for people to learn stuff. Surely you could create uh, products that help people in yep. their healthcare. And now we're all putting on Fitbit, right? Yep. So, I mean, Apple. So the two I was thinking was Facebook and Apple surely are answering this gentleman's question. They have all that data. Well, it, it's not just them that have okay. a lot of data. You know, your retailer knows what food you buy, baskets. No, but I mean the depth and breadth of it, right? Yeah, the retailer you know, will know. You know, they, they know your basket. If you have a loyalty yeah. card, they'll know exactly what you bought and they'll know, you know, your diet. And, th and maybe they'll have better information in some ways. Yeah. The question is, I think, th th there's two questions on this. There's a question for, do executives yeah. have enough mindset on what the opportunity is there? And secondly, do executives have enough idea about the risks and how to deal with protection? And I, I, I'm particularly worried about the second one, because I think we're seeing more and more executives beginning to realize that the data is a huge opportunity and be creative on that. What I struggle to see is whether many boards around the world, with the possible exception of companies like Facebook, have any idea to, about how to think about data security. You, know, you look at the companies getting hacked, it is easy to get hacked, you know, Sony, you know, Talksoft, I mean, there, there are lots of examples about companies that got hacked by government, quasi-government, or very, very intelligent criminals. And in some cases, fairly unintelligent criminals. I mean, you know, the Talksoft hack, it looks as if they were a bunch of 16-year-olds, hacked a, a company, and um, you know, friends of mine are on the board there. The CEO used to be a colleague of mine. And, and you know, the challenge is great PPE degree from Oxford, 
hasn't necessarily had the right education about how to think about this. But I think that's a huge challenge that every board faces. You know, how many board members could really think about you know, the risk of hacking and what's it really going to take, or the risk of misuse of data? And you know, there's a huge short supply. Maybe they should have, instead of a, just an audit committee, have a data security committee, as well as one of the board so subcommittees. So, Jaime, Jaime you, you actually brought this up that. because. Yeah. Um, in the topics we were thinking about, you, you were the only person that actually mentioned threat mm. in this, in the transformation and innovation. So how do you, yeah. how do you deal with this well, on your well, board? Well, listening to the, to the conversation, um, I'll, I'll give the mirror image of it. I think in order to access that data, uh, in order to get analytics, um, and increasingly our networks are becoming more sophisticated, going deeper, and becoming integral uh, to our lives. And, anything you read now on the changes in the automotive industry and the way that's evolving, we are being so linked by these networks and there's a lot of money and investment and sophistication going into them. But look at the mirror image of that um, as one threat, which is if anything goes wrong with that network, um, we can't do any of the things that we've now gotten this new mindset yeah, yeah. Uh, to do. Um, the most fascinating question I, uh, I got, I heard asked uh, in a gathering, uh, which I've never forgotten was, and it was a serious gathering about large-scale cybercrime. At what point do you consider a breakdown of our major facilities based on hacking an act of war? And I thought that was just fascinating. <laughs> I said, you know, never, uh, once upon a time, it was just conventional warfare that would lead. Yeah. But here, um, our, our, our networks are becoming so sensitive and are the cornerstone of this innovation we've been discussing. Yeah. What happens if somebody, if that's our Achilles heel and if someone attacks it um, and breaks it down in, in a way that, uh, that, 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 that can be considered hacking or cybercrime, um, what are the implications of that for nation states as well? We can't live without those yeah. networks connecting into each other. So from a threat point of view, um, I'm concerned that the pace is moving so fast, the interconnection is moving so quickly, the investment necessary because young people and are demanding it is going, uh, moving so extensively, what happens when, when that is put in, in question? And the, the, the hacking incidents that we've seen, yes, they're serious, but they're all at independent levels, a corporation here, an individual there, some pictures there. But what happens when a system that controls utilities and the like gets I broke down? I, I, I would consider that a major concern. Yeah. And would that, would that hold you back from innovation? No, no, not at all. I, 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 I don't think it should stop anything that's happening. I just think one has to take up the level of protection uh, to a whole different level mm. to be able to keep all of that in place, I guess is the point I'm making. Yeah. So I, I'm so concerned about, is it, is it that who, the things like the security, the trust, the reg, the, is that the job of, 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 of the corporate or is it the job of, of, of public? Both. Both. We have to protect ourselves from uh, using, you know, advanced technology. But uh, the government has to work on it, just like the hacking from other countries. Yeah. They both have to collaborate and uh, find the solution. This is always, an, an I mean, hacking is always uh, an advancing, advancing, mm. uh, work together. This is the role of the business and the government, both. So do we have another, another we, oh, there we go. Barbara Maynard from the, from the Asia Global Institute. i just like to shift the discussion a bit with this question. Um, it's about artificial intelligence. <laughs> I, I believe very much in technology and the progress that technology brings. But, you know, at which point does it become harmful when you know, is there a possibility that machines can take over from human beings when they become more intelligent? I just watched um, for three nights running the three parts of the Matrix, <laughs> which, <laughs> uh, which is actually very good. <laughs> and, um, the, and, and I know that the de debate is now going on in the world. And when you have somebody like Bill Gates expressing concern that we have to sort of be careful about artificial intelligence. You know, where, where is the line of this progress? And I wonder what the panel members think of this. Excellent question. I think, uh, Richard, we can, we can uh, yeah. Yeah. deal with this. I mean, the, uh, just to give you some context, I know that in the tech world, they're now calling it enhanced intelligence. 
So it's not replacing you, it's just enhancing your brain power, right? But rather like virtual reality and all those things. But maybe Richard well, could... Well, you, you talked about the Matrix. I think this is about the Terminator scenario, you know, <laughs> the, the Skynet becoming self-aware or whatever <laughs> and taking over the world. And actually, I, I think it, while it's a slight risk, there's a much bigger risk from technology, and that's the impact it has on jobs. And if you really want to say what gets me worried about the pace of technology, the faster and faster, you know, Angry Birds 35 days, telephone 75 years, it's the fact that jobs are going to be replaced faster than we can retrain and create new jobs. And that's the bit that, that, that I think is a much, much bigger risk. Because as the technology comes in, we did some research where we looked at activities and found about 30 to 40 percent of activities can actually be replaced by machines over the next 10, 15 years, by artificial intelligence, by you know, self-service, self et cetera. And as we start going to that, we find that there's going to be a growing underclass who used to be able to go into jobs, and those jobs are going to disappear. And I give you one example, the one that really worries me, you know, as a specific example, is the rise of self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles. There are about two and a half million people in the US directly driving for a professional. Trucks, buses, taxis. Mm. Think about those machines replacing those jobs. Where are those people? These are high school leavers in most cases. It's a great job to go into from high school. You don't need to have a lot of skills. Exactly. You can learn it. And what's going to be the path for the unskilled? It's fine. The STEM people from universities, they're going to be in demand. They're going to be data scientists inventing all this stuff or anti-hackers or whatever. Lots of jobs for them. But the high school lever and how they go in, and that's what worries me, not the, the, the Terminator syndrome. I think uh, we had Elon Musk in uh, town yeah. uh, on Tuesday. And he, he said that in five years, mm. cars won't have steering wheels. So you'll, you'll order yeah. a steering wheel like you sure. might do a special sure. hi-fi yeah. system and you put your car, yeah. which I thought kind of yep. begs, begs your but, point. But think about lorries. Think about lorries and buses and all of those other stuff. I mean, it's a huge productivity advantage because these things will run 24 hours and, you know, and the accident rates are going to go down. Yeah. But the, the, the downside is you know, there's a set of jobs that are the unskilled are going to disappear. But, but you, your, your country is famous for producing amazing technology in cars. So how do you see this, this point? Where's your fear in terms of the AI link? Yeah, well, there, 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 this is a case uh, which we are now discussing. There's a, a, a one pa you know, a man who is about to be run by the uh, car. And, and, but another uh, uh, child is coming in, you know, running into which person can be run over? This is an ethical issue. You mean, you right? mean the algorithm? The algorithm yes, has to decide. That's right. But depends on country. For example, Germany, you know, even this person, for example, suffering uh, from cancer, maybe his life expectancy is uh, 30 days. He, he is a child. Well, has a long longevity, right? Because of technology, maybe 100 years more. But this is ethical issue. But the AI can't make a solution. Mm. He or she can't judge. Mm. This is judged by a people. Anyway, we have to decide anyway, by instinct or not. But uh, you know, I agree with you. Definitely, this uh, you know technology AI increases a huge, tremendous uh, uh, productivity. But he or she can't decide. Finally, because uh, human beings have to decide ethical conflict. So we can't overexpect. Definitely we have to see as a human being by seeing and uh, developing more higher technology. But couldn't that car just tap into the big health pool that we talked about and go, that's a man with cancer, <laughs> forget about him. <laughs> you know, this is a 12 year old child who's currently doing this course at uh, yeah. this accelerated program. Sure. Yeah, so well, good question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we had another question. Uh, we have a few. Uh, we, where's our runners? I guess. Hope. Hi, Minchi. Uh, teaching at the Faculty of Engineering of this University. Um, as an engineer, I'm very happy that, um, that there are actually people emphasize the science and technology, particularly with the dialogue between the academia and the industry. I think this is very important. We're very much happy to serve the development industry. However, in terms of a more sustainable development, 
Uh, what about uh, the, the potential opportunity for uh, the academia to serve the social needs and also the environmental needs? When you are having the opportunity to have a dialogue with the you know, economic, economic growth from the industry, um, how you welcome the, the collective conversation together with the uh, social group, the environmental group for your growth? Or you actually prefer a separate, di a separate dialogues? You don't want to talk to the environmental part, you don't want to talk about the social part. I just want to know a little bit of uh, what are the mechanisms that you prefer and how you're going to design that for an overall more sustainable process. Thank you. Jaime, I think this is addressed to you because the fact you spend four days yeah. with, I presume there's many stakeholders in the room, I not I just academia, you have. I would argue that you have to look at things holistically. I think the whole issue of sustainability is also changing the way uh, institutions and corporations are looking at itself. And this is just a slight digression, but I think that is an area that has evolved. Uh, I think the whole, and it goes back to something Richard was talking about, about trust. Uh, generally, the, the private sector, corporations, you know, trust has fallen down across the board. and. Uh, and even more so, and, and the stakes are so much higher in emerging markets like ours, where they have an inordinate access to the talent, capital, and, and in many cases have the capability to do so much more than the public sector. But uh, there is, I think, some uh, self-reflection taking place, and, and, and that self-reflection is a complex one that incorporates issues of the future of technology, as we've been discussing, but also takes into account issues that make institutions part of a, a future society that is progressive. Uh, sustainability m moves beyond the environment now. It, 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 it revolves around employment. It revolves about the use of assets. Um, I think, I would argue uh, anyway, that um, those dialogues must take place a little bit holistically. Now, I, if I'm guessing at what you're referring at, you've got some very strong advocacy groups with very strong feelings that are independent and, and focused just on their area of, of advocacy um, and, and, and maybe independent dialogues would be needed in those cases. But I would argue that a, a, a new holistic view of how institutions should evolve and what parts of society they should touch should be, uh, should be encompassed within a whole rather than independently. Uh, that would just be my, my argument. Do you find this in your dealings with, as an advisor to the Prime Minister of Japan that you sustainability comes up in these discussions you're having? Well, uh, such as clean energy, yeah. we have to increase the bioengineers as well as the data scientists uh, in quality education. But uh, we are facing there to inspect and uh, we need more professors to teach. So that's a chicken and egg. So that's why I mentioned that we should bring uh, the uh, high brains from uh, around the world. Mm. Uh, definitely clean energy is the issue of the you know, especially Asia. And uh, we can uh, collaborate with the uh, lots of uh, PhDs uh, toward the uh, clean energy. And uh, definitely uh, academia has to do and uh, funded by the government you know, I mean, uh, with that regard. And we are allocating. And plus, corporations have to support because uh, this creates uh, uh, eventually a lot of investments, uh, investment opportunity for corporations. This is a joint work between uh, the government and the, and the private sector, definitely. Excellent, so I think we, we, we'll, we'll wrap up there. I think um, some of the takeaways was definitely that there are threats, but don't let them stop you from innovating. I think that the most poignant thing to me was the education element and uh, the role of that in changing people's perceptions as well as your intuition you talk about. And I, I, I still feel that the, the data thing is something that nobody has really got their heads around. Uh, we're all trying to, but whether it's corporates or governments mm. or academic institutions, I think it's, it's a, a subject that I would like to see tackled more. But thank you very much. Thank you.